Today, we visit Antioch's, a copper mining ghost town in a remote part of British Columbia, Canada, located on the shores of Granby Bay. In 1910, the Granby Consolidated Mining, Smelting and Power Company, Granby Consolidated, started buying land in the area. It would become one of the largest copper mining operations in the British Empire during this time. Granby Consolidated started construction of the town around 1912 and by 1914 with the mine and smelter in full operation, the town had grown to a population of around 3,000 residents. Ore from the mines was transported by rail to crushers and then processed at a nearby smelter. Health and working conditions were very poor and a major issue. The fumes from the smelter stack were so toxic that the surrounding forest was killed off for many kilometers in all directions around the town. Everyday life was linked to copper prices and as they slumped so would the safety and workplace accidents would increase. The town was remote and served by steamships as there were no road or rail connections to the outside world. That meant the town of 3000 had to be self-sufficient and have all the amenities to attract workers and their families. There was a general store, a post office, hospital, a bank, a movie house and more and every home was heated and had running water. In the early 1920s, a hydroelectric dam was built by engineer John Eastwood to supply electricity to the town and mining operation. It stands at 44 meters tall and at the time of completion was the tallest dam in Canada. For safety reasons, the dam was breached with holes in several locations to allow water flow and to prevent overtopping of the dam after abandonment in 1935. The current owner has plans to refurbish the dam and put it back in use. The Great Depression drove down the demand for copper and was the beginning of the end for Antiochs. Operations continued while the company stockpiled 100 million pounds of copper over the next three years that it was unable to sell. The mine shut down in 1935 and the town was abandoned. Salvage operations in the late 1930s and early 1940s for the war effort removed most machinery and steel. In 1942, there was just a small crew remaining and a fire tore through the town and burned down all remaining wooden structures. In total, Antioch's mines and smelters produced some 140,000 ounces of gold, 8 million ounces of silver, and 760 million pounds of copper. Since 1942, besides a few mining exploration companies that come and go, and a company that mines the smelter slag pile for industrial abrasives, Antioch sits mostly forgotten. The concrete and steel structures that still exist are being reclaimed by nature. Join me on this adventure with my friend Mike and our guide Rob as we explore for two days to discover what remains. There was a stack on that uh, steam plant we drove right in front. But if you look closely, you can see there's a building that's all intact. That was the mess hall. So today I'm in the ghost town of Antioch in British Columbia. And I'm here with Mike, Mike the Urban Explorer, good buddy of mine. We came up here to explore this awesome place. We're here with Rob. He's showing us around. This is the mess hall. It's one of our first stops. You'll see the old stairs right there. It's going to be a pretty big explore. There's lots here to see. Grinder. 
quite a bit left. <laughs> Look at the ceiling. of it then a big building this one here massive building three levels and then if you look right behind you concrete posts out here Twyford's LTD Hanley England pretty big structure They took fire very seriously with all the wood houses, everything. So what they did was they made these fire buckets like this with a point, so they're no use to anybody. So these hung on every corner around town and they had a big barrel of water sitting right below them, but they were always on a hook. So they're no use to anyone to take home because they just oh. tipped over. You put water in it, boom, it falls over. So people wouldn't steal these because, you know, no damage, they're useless. So. But for them, when they're on a hook on the edge of a road, a wooden plank road, now they're valuable. They always had water in it. The kids were taught, don't touch, don't mess with these things. Don't play with them. Yeah, because fire was a serious business around the town. So, yeah. so is that like the, uh, like the stolen light bulbs I heard about? Exactly the same thing. <laughs> the steam plant is located across Falls Creek from powerhouse number one. During cold winter months, Falls Creek water flow was too low to fully power the mine site. This steam plant was built to handle this shortage of power. Yeah, very cool. This place has always looked cool, especially when you see nature taken back over. Like that moss over there. Little trees starting to grow up through. started our tour but it's already just amazing very cool I love seeing all this stuff learning all about the history and Rob's really knowledgeable so this section that we're looking at basically was full of like a, a gyrating crusher a ball mill a rod mill a roll mill so they had uh, six inch rocks came in here. The train tracks were on top of this thing. Trains came in and dumped all their ore in there. And in there would have been a six inch section of rock that came down and they put it into a powder through a series of mills. So same thing they do today. They got big crushing units, gyrating crushers, balls, you know, big steelies. Yeah. And they put rocks in there, you know, and it just pounds it into a powder. And what the concentrator did was take that powder, so the rock powder, took it up there and there's these big flotation ponds in here and you'll see one of them up here and they basically add oxygen from the bottom and then they add cyanide and other chemicals and the cyanide and the oxygen bind to the copper and the gold all the good stuff and then they float it to the surface they scoop it off they dry it and then it gets sent to the smelter and they uh and they burn it off there and that's oh. how you get your copper So there's three train cars that flipped over here down the bank. Flipped upside down. They're still in pretty good condition, actually. So did they have an accident and they just left them? I <laughs> guess. I don't know. Nobody yeah. knows the story.
all the bearing hubs. And I think that's Coke and Coal. Coke provided with coal, and they made a real like high premium kind of coal out of it. They burnt off a bunch of stuff. Originally, this was a, uh, they put all the dynamite away from the mine and away from the town. And then in between the railway tracks, it was easy access. So we're kind of a ways away from the town, away from the thing. Big steel door there. Okay guys, we're continuing on our tour of Antioch, and we're going up to one of the highlights here, and that's the dam. It's a very impressive structure. The number two hydroelectric dam is located up Falls Creek, roughly five kilometers from the town site and around 2.5 kilometers above the original rock and log crib number one dam. It was built between 1922 and 1924 to meet the demands of more power and water that was needed to operate the new concentrator and other expansions at the site. The number one dam did not have the capacity to hold back enough water in the cold winter months to meet this new demand. They needed this consistent year-round water supply that the new number two dam could now provide. John Eastwood designed and engineered the dam who built the world's first reinforced concrete multiple arch dam at Hume Lake, California in 1908. He sought new ways to innovate and be efficient with minimizing the amount of concrete necessary to reduce costs which was perfect for remote sites such as Antioch's. The Antioch's dam is a remarkable example of this multiple arch design. His designs faced strong opposition from engineers that were advocates for massive gravity dams. Most arguments concerning Eastwood's design did not necessarily focus on technical issues, but more on public confidence in this thin arch design. They believed it did not provide a proper visual assurance of strength. In a 1924 letter, he celebrated the Antioch Dam's performance in withstanding and overtopping through an uncompleted arch. He was proud of the Antioch Dam and had said it was the most beautiful dam in the world. The dam was abandoned in 1935, and as you can see, almost 100 years later, the dam is still standing and intact, which is a testament to this design.
if you guys know me, I don't really care for heights too much. But I actually don't mind this up here. <laughs> Still working. Yeah, it's very impressive for... So when was this built? 1923, 24. Seems like a very unique design too. Just with how the arches are just the curves, isn't it? Or is that... Yeah, it is very unique. This guy was very artistic and Thin concrete was his whole thing, like remote places like this. Yeah. As little concrete as possible, but using all the engineering principles. You can see some stairs down there. And we get earthquakes out here. Yeah, this is an impressive structure. Very cool. Now we're just walking down to the bottom of the dam. Get a better look at it from down here. Very impressive structure. Yeah, look at the curves and the construction. Very unique looking. Okay, we're just finishing up here at the dam. We're gonna head on down the road. Yeah, very cool structure. All of Antioch so far is just amazing. There's so much here to explore. Highly recommend coming here on a tour if you can. So, great stuff. This is one of the tea boxes here. Oh. If you look close, see the little square? There's yeah. There's a piece of wood right here. It kind of comes across here. There's that piece, so there's a square tea box. That's cool. Nine holes. Nine holes. Yeah, oiled uh, greens. Yeah, look at that view. So this is the slag pile. It's left over. There's actually a company that comes in here and takes some of this out still. Very impressive building. especially when you see some of the pictures from when it was in operation. The inside was just pristine. So here in Antioch, they mined for copper. And it shut down in 1935, I believe, because the markets collapsed, price of copper went down Yeah, this building still has some wood on it. So the fire didn't get this that went through in 1942. It pretty much wiped out the whole town, that fire. All wooden structures were pretty much burnt to the ground. And there was also salvage operations too that came in and removed a lot of metals. Constructed in 1911, Powerhouse No. 1 sits at the base of Falls Creek to take advantage of its water source. The steep hill behind the building was an optimal location for the water pipes and penstocks. This powerhouse provided electricity for the smelter, mining operations, and the town. Very cool look in here. 
just that industrial mixed with nature. It always looks cool. There's Mike up there getting some photos. Trees growing up, moss everywhere. Wow, there's so many valves over here. It's like you don't even really know where to look here. There's so much stuff. Oh, this place is cool. Huge building. Something pretty cool that Rob told us about here. You see the brick on the end here? How oh, there's white brick. And then it changes to the other color. Well, this end here was actually added on at a later date. So they made the building a little bit longer here. I think to fit some of this equipment in here. So this is what's called a Pelton wheel. So water came in there and yeah, spun this generator right here. And back over here, right in the middle there, that's actually a vertical one. Good flow. Very cool, what a place. There's a 15 ton crane. This concludes our day one exploration of Antioch. Next time, we spend our second day exploring the town site, cemetery, and much more. Then, we will conclude our trip by going back to the source of where it all started for Antioch, the copper. I will take you underground to a section of the Hidden Creek Mine where few have gone since it was abandoned. This and much more coming up. I will see you next time.